Hello and welcome to this IFAF flag football training video. I'm Jed Brooks Lewis and today we're going to be talking about the most important changes being introduced in the 2021 edition of the IFAF flag football rulebook. 2020 has obviously been a difficult year with seasons across the world being curtailed or cancelled entirely but the rules committee have continued their tireless work to drive improvements in the rules, close loopholes and create a document that allows a safe and exciting sport to be played. The most important changes are listed below. There are other minor ones and if you would like further information, full details can be found in the rule changes section of the newly published document. There will also be timestamps for each of the changes listed here in the description of this video in order to allow you to jump easily to specific sections as required. Before we get into discussing each change, it's important to mention the key three factors the committee consider when discussing potential rules changes. The first and most important is player safety. We want to ensure that we are keeping the sport as safe as possible for its participants and any proposed changes must not jeopardize this. The second is competitive integrity, promoting a fair game with neither the offense or defense receiving a significant advantage over the other from any proposed change. The final one is quality of product. With flag football growing significantly each year and with inclusion in events such as the World Games in 2022, the committee wants to create a game that is exciting to watch and participate in and is visually appealing without making sacrifices to the first two factors mentioned. So without further ado, let's look at the biggest changes being introduced this year. The first change we're going to look at is to rules 131 and 132 concerning player equipment, specifically flag and pants colour. From this year, flags now only have to clearly contrast to all colours on the pants, as opposed to the previous rule which stated that they had to be of a single colour. This allows custom flag designs to be legally used as long as they do not contain colours that closely match those in the team's pants. The reason this has been changed is because the committee feels that it is enough for the flags to just have to contrast from the pants and that it is a little over officious to mandate that they also must be of a single colour on top of this which also potentially stands in the way of flag manufacturers who want to showcase some creativity in their designs. From the next edition of the rulebook which is scheduled to be introduced in 2023 Minimum standards are going to be introduced covering factors such as flag design and the required strength to pull a flag. These changes are set out in the current rulebook in order to give manufacturers and teams the maximum amount of time to make any necessary adjustments. This is also the case for changes to the rules around pants colours. From 2023, pants must be of a single colour except for branding or numbers on each leg which must be of a maximum size of 10 by 10 centimeters on each. The next change is a relatively minor one to rules 211.2 and 211.4. Blocking is being renamed to shielding, whilst targeting is being changed to aiming. The reason for these changes is because both blocking and targeting are commonly used words across different codes of football and can imply certain meanings that are not relevant to flag football specifically. There is no change to how the penalties for either of these fouls are enforced. Shielding, or as it used to be blocking, remains as a five yard penalty whilst aiming, formerly targeting, is still a category of illegal contact fouls. Moving on to rule 311 concerning the coin toss procedure. We are changing back to the system that was used between 2015 and 2017 where the winner of the toss chooses whether to have the ball in the first or second half with the loser choosing which end to defend in the first half and then the team swapping at the end of the first half. The reason for this change is because under the old system the winner would have a double choice if they elected to take the ball in the second half as they would also get to then choose the end for the ends of the first half as well. This felt a little illogical and inequitable to the committee, so it's been changed, so this is no longer the case. 
The next change is to rule 326 and concerns the introduction of what's been termed the running clock. In games where one team is heavily ahead and scoring easily, the last two minutes of each half can last a significant amount of time with the clock stopping for situations such as touchdowns. This can result in disruptions to wider tournament schedules with games having to fall behind and starting late. The new rule states that if the score differential is 30 points or above when the two minute warning is reached in either half, the clock will then not stop for situations it normally would for, such as scores or incomplete passes, meaning that games which are clearly decided will end in a more timely fashion. One small caveat to this is that once the two minute warning is reached and the clock status is decided, then that decision is final and it won't change even if the score difference drops below or reaches 30. If it's a running clock, it will remain a running clock even if the score difference goes below 30. And if it is a standard clock, normal timing rules will stay in place even if the score difference reaches 30 points or above. The committee has also made changes to rule 725 with it now being an illegal touching foul for a quarterback to touch a forward pass uh, they've thrown that has not been touched by a defender. This is a relatively small change and has basically been put in place in order to reduce the situations where the offense can force a situation where the quarterback can run with the ball. It sits alongside the rule that was introduced in 2019, which outlawed the bounce pass play where the quarterback would bounce the ball off the centre's back and then run with it and as previously mentioned is just another loophole being closed in this area. Changes have also been made to rule 911 concerning the enforcement of the penalty for illegal contact fouls by the offence. These fouls now also carry a loss of down penalty alongside the 10 yards enforced from the basic spot, which is normally the line of scrimmage or the spot of the foul, depending on which is worse for the offense. This change has been made to further protect player safety, making the penalty stronger for fouls committed by the offense. It also means that it is less important whether a foul by the offense on a pass play is called as pass interference or illegal contact. Previously, only offensive pass interference carried a loss of down, meaning that the officials needed to be really aware of what type of foul was being committed. But this is no longer the case, and the enforcement is now consistent across the two fouls, as it is for illegal contact and pass interference fouls com com committed by the defence. This also applies to game interference fouls, which are covered under Rule 912. There has also been a change to the enforcement for illegal handoff fouls under Rule 715. Previously, this was a five yard penalty from the previous spot, whereas it is now a five yard penalty from the spot of the foul and also includes a loss of down. This change is again to bring more consistency to the rule book. With it being enforced as it is now, it aligns it with the penalties that are enforced for both illegal forward and backward passes. Some small changes have been made to the substitution rules found in Rule 931. Firstly, it's been clarified that it is a foul for any player to enter the field after the ball has been snapped, and that's even the case if a team only had four players on the field at the snap. This is a live ball foul and is penalized five yards from the line of scrimmage. It's further been clarified that once the snapper has touched the ball, no offensive player can enter or leave the field. And this is a dead ball foul, again being enforced five yards. Finally, the concept of challenges has been introduced to the rulebook and this codifies a practice that was already being used by officials in game situations. Once in each half and once in overtime, the head coach or captain of a team may challenge a ruling on the field made by the officials. 
This challenge must be about an error in rules application or penalty enforcement with judgment calls such as whether there was enough contact for pass interference or if a receiver completed a catch not being challengeable. If a challenge is successful then the error is corrected and the game continues. However, if it is unsuccessful then the challenging team are charged with a timeout. If the game's in overtime or the team has no timeouts remaining then they are charged with a five yard penalty instead. This brings us to the end of this video. I hope it has proved useful to you in understanding the changes being implemented to the rules in the latest edition. And I wish you all good luck in your upcoming season. Thank you very much for watching.